doing as that. Um, welcome, everybody. It's particularly good to um, welcome tonight John Pinder. Um, John has a very close connection with Melanesia. He taught in the Solomon Islands in All Hallows School Power and Selwyn College in Guadalcanal, which um, some of you may remember um, I showed you uh, when I visited there. Uh, he taught there from 1967 to 1972. And he was English secretary to the Melanesian Mission in the UK from 1975 to 1989. And he's been a trustee of MMUK um, since 1994. Until last year, I think, John, wasn't it? You you That's hung right. up your laurels. Um, mm -hmm. He's also commissary to um, the Archbishop of Melanesia, um, David Venaghi, who's a fascinating uh, chap and uh, he was he did that from 2009 to 2015 so really does know Solomon Islands very well also lovely to introduce Marie um, Marie uh, was the, th the third of the three musketeers when Katie uh, myself went out um, and it was lovely to get to know Marie and Marie is the care for creation officer at uh, MMUK she's also a PhD student at Southampton University uh, and she's been looking at the impact of climate change and um, coastal hazards on rural island communities. So some real wisdom, knowledge in the room this evening. And this in this first session, we're going to be hearing um, from John about the theology of care for creation, um, establishing why we should care for the environment. And then we're going to look at hope in the face of climate change with Marie. Um, not entirely sure, guys, if you want questions, are there opportunities for that? How's the evening going to slightly run, just to get people have an idea of, of what where, when they might require to do something? Um, so I'm going to start with a short introduction on um, creation care in general. Um, during that phase, whenever you have a question, feel welcome to just put it in the chat or raise your hand. Um, and we can directly answer it. Um, I don't know about you, John, how do you prefer your questions? I'm, I'm happy to take questions at, at the end of what I want to say, but um, I'd rather not sort of interrupt the flow, if you know what I mean. That's really helpful. Thank you. So um, if you could mute yourselves, please, that would be really helpful if you're not already muted. And uh, over to you guys. Thank you. So. Before I um, hand over to, to Marie and John, um, most of you know me, I'm Katie Drew from the Melanesian Mission. And we are a mission agency that works in the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu and New Caledonia. Um, we're not a relief agency. We're not an environmental charity. But as you're aware, the fifth mark of mission is to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew life on the earth. So care of creation is always going to be a part of what we do as an Anglican mission agency. And Melanesians has been telling us about changes in their environment for a number of years. And Marie, I don't know, are you showing the quote from um, Archbishop George to Kelly? I think I might. Um... Right. So I shall I shall leave that over to you. But um, we started to take more of an interest in what was going over in Melanesia because of what Melanesians were telling us. They were telling us these different things were happening. And so we felt obliged to actually start sharing their stories with with people um, in the UK. So we started making films and you're going to see some of them tonight on what's happening over in Melanesia. And we started working with the University of Southampton because we're certainly not scientists. And we started co-funding uh, Marie's PhD. So that's why the Melanesian Mission is involved with this project. And I want to thank Marie for all the work she's done for the charity and for John uh, for his contribution um, over the years and to this evening. So thanks very much and over to Marie. Thank you, Katie. Um, just give me a second to start sharing my screen with you. Okay. Um, I hope you're all seeing the start screen now because I can only see the screen now. Uh, so let me know if that's not the case. Um, so yeah, welcome to the um, first session in the three um, event uh, course basically on creation care. Um, so today, as uh, Lydia said, oh, it's all about theology and hope, um, but uh, you're very welcome to also 
um, come next week, um, where we'll be talking a lot more about uh, the science of climate change. And then there's also going to be an in-person event uh, run by Lydia and Katie um, towards the end of November. So just before we start, um, I'm sure you've been on Zoom before, but just in case you're not quite familiar with all the different things here, uh, on the left hand side, you should either have a um, this bar on the bottom or on the top of your screen. Uh, so there's the unmute button in case you would like to say anything, ask a question. Uh, please just interrupt me in the first part because I can't see you actually. Um, and then there's the video button. Um, you're welcome to put your questions in the chat as well, um, in which case John and I could answer them at the end as well. If you don't want to wait that long to just you know note them down. And there's also a reactions uh, button that you can use to reply to anything that might become uh, interesting in the last bit when we're talking about hope because um, we will all get a little bit more interactive um, so you can start using um, the reactions as well. So um, usually I always start this uh, with a short introduction um, but so Lydia obviously knows all of you but it would be really nice if you could just type in the chat um, your name and where you're based so that uh, John and I can also um, learn a little bit about you before we come to our discussion at the end. So just whenever you feel like you have a bit of time, just maybe type your name um, and where you're based in the chat. That would be really nice um, for me to know. Um, and before we really start into the topic now, we are all going to um, watch um, a little movie that the um, Milanesian mission um, has uh, been um, filming um, in Solomon Islands and that really introduces the topic of climate change and the issues um, that are in Melanesia uh, in the South Pacific uh, regarding climate change. So I'm just going to start this and we're going to watch a little bit of this uh, film. Any minute now just round the corner, we're going to come to Walande Island and village, which was washed away a couple of years now. And so I'm just trading what is fine left of that beautiful, vibrant village. Walande is a village built on a coral reef. People have to live here because they have nowhere else to build their homes. The island is man-made and hundreds of years old. This looks like the end of the road. Oh, it's here, here, sir. Carry Simon. Look at this. Look at all this. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Boy, steady. Carry Simon. Good grief. On behalf of Chief, Chairman, and members of Walland Village Committee, church leaders, elders, and all the living Christian souls of this tiny artificial island. It is a great honor and privilege to have an opportunity to convey our warm and cordial brief welcome speech to you all. Come on. And he's just pointing out to me that the whole island is gone Two remaining houses are there. One two is all gone. How sad, how sad it is. You know, a thriving village lost to the waves. Yeah. It's not safe here. Not because, safe anymore. Yeah, not safe anymore. So we decided to move inland. The church was there. Yeah. Yes, underwater now. Wow, James. All this whole place, together. is it all this left? Yeah. Look, the tide is yeah. coming in now. And it's almost gulfing up this whole place. Look over there, that's the stumps left of the village. Yeah. It was all over there. Now it's all underwater. It's tragic what has happened to a beautiful island village like this, Wallander. I was in my house and I heard uh, screaming around the village and I saw that the very huge waves were breaking against the wall stone and uh, suddenly the wall stone break down and the waves keep on to come in, come in. Uh, each day another lot of waves come again 
and keep on breaking for the whole week. And I was feel so frightened because that's my first time since I was growing up in this village. I haven't seen uh, something like that. Children running everywhere. And as I can see from my house, I saw the utensils yeah, floating. And I said, I think must be this is a very serious thing happened to my village. Okay, um, so this has been an introduction um, to one of the communities um, in Solomon Islands that is actually one of my case study sites for my PhD as well, um, that has really been suffering um, from the impacts of uh, sea level rise already. It's not just sea level rise, it's also storms coming in, um, but it shows what could happen in a lot more places across Solomon Islands um, in uh, the near future with climate change and with sea level rise. Um, so just to give a short overview of what we're going to do today is um, we'll first look into what climate change actually is um, and what environmental degradation is and then um, delve more into the theology um, regarding uh, care for creation um, and hope um, and then later on um, we'll also have a short discussion about where we can find hope uh, for us um, with climate change and there are also some liturgy resources that we have um, for um, creation care. So just to give a short overview, um, obviously our environment is anything that surrounds us and um, the world is super varied in the different climates and the different types of landscapes that we find um, across the world, whether it's a desert, uh, whether it's um, a jungle, uh, mountainous landscape, the Arctic, um, or even under the sea. Um, but what they all have in common is that they're all affected um, by our actions as humans living with the environment um, and what we do every day um, on this planet. Um, so a question that I always um, start with um, is, I would like you to take a minute to just reflect um, for yourself um, why and find an answer to why we should care um, for the environment. Um, and um, after that, you're very welcome to just um, post it in the chat as well. Um, but you're also welcome to just have your own answer for yourself. Um, and then we'll um, continue. Um, so yeah, um, take a bit of time now. And um, maybe we can do some silent reflection on the question. Okay, um, yeah, if you um, would like to, please feel free to share it um, in the chat. And I already see um, this, um, it's a gift from God um, to use carefully and wisely and not for exploitation. Um, we are caretakers for future generations. Um, why care for the environment? Um, it's our only home. Uh, the earth is God's creation and mankind are charged with being stewards. Um, fit carers of it um, because God made it and cares for it um, it is good yeah thank you very much um, for those um, so um, on a very practical side of things um, the environment um, provides for all of us um, everything that we need uh, air food water any resources that we use to make um, any of the nice things that we have around us um are coming from the environment so um, from a very biological perspective human beings are entirely dependent on the natural environment uh, for their continued um, survival and at the moment um, unfortunately what's happening um, around the world is that we have a decline in the quality of our environment and that's what's called environmental degradation um, that's way wider than just climate change um, it's also um, pollution of water and air due to industrial activities, uh, intensive land agriculture or landfills, 
over-exploitation of resources, um, when you think about overfishing, hunting, um, fossil fuel extraction, mining, deforestation. Um, also, uh, more and more people are living on the planet, um, which obviously means that more and more resources are needed. Um, and also, we are living way more luxurious lifestyles um, than just a few you know, decades ago. And even 100 years ago, you know, there's been a progression. Um, then there's been destruction due to wars and military testing. Um, climate change uh, comes next. And as, as you can see, it's just one of all of these things that humans are doing to uh, alter the planet. And um, there's also natural causes of environmental degradation. So these can be wildfires, landslides, tsunamis, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions. Um, so there's a lot of different things that contribute to environmental degradation. But in the last um, couple of uh, centuries, really, it's been humans that have been um, had mm -hmm. having a major impact um, on our environment. And when we talk about climate change, uh, we mean the anthropogenic, so human-made uh, climate change is the large-scale, long-term shift in the Earth's average weather patterns and temperatures due to human activities. So not everything that we see that is changing around the world is climate change, um, but when it comes to our weather and our climate um, due to greenhouse gas emissions, and we'll talk about that more next week, um, then we're talking about climate change. Um, I actually have just seen that I put a different quote into this one. It's not uh, the Archbishop of Melanesia, but it's Archbishop uh, Justin Welby. Um, and he's had a really nice quote about caring for creation. It becomes ever clearer that climate change is the greatest challenge that we and future generations face. It's our sacred duty to protect the natural world we've so generously been given, as well as our neighbors around the world who will be first and worst affected. Without swift decisive action, the consequences of climate change will be devastating. So this brings um, another dimension into the things that I've just already said. There's not only um, the, you know, the biological consequences that I just said about um, uh, humans being affected, but it also brings in the aspect about our responsibility for future generations and for people in different areas in the world. Um, and that also brings us for caring for creation and for caring for people. And now I would like to hand over to John, um, who will be talking a lot more about the theology uh, related to climate change and caring for creation. So over to you, John. Thank you, Marie. Um, so I hope to share some theological insights with you, um, but also um, in, interspersed with my theological insights, uh, some examples from the Pacific. So we'll begin with um, a series of slides. The tiny island of Tikapia in the Western Pacific is one of the remotest places on earth. So much so that when Cyclone Zoe struck the island in December 2004, it was more than a week before any contact from the outside world was made. There was international speculation about the fate of the islanders, how much devastation had been caused. But we need not have worried. Tikopians have been so isolated, they're used to coping with emergencies. They don't need satellites to warn them about cyclones. Next slide. They can read the signs from weather patterns and the behavior of the birds. They will haul their canoes to safety. They will retreat to the caves to ride out the storm. Dried breadfruit provides emergency rations. Next, please. Their houses squat low on the ground and have a better chance of survival. When the cyclone moves on, they will soon be out fishing again. Next, please. They will be replanting their banana trees and coconut palms. Next, please. Their taro gardens will be planted. Next, please. There will be dancing again. 
Tikapir is no garden of Eden. Their resources are finite and can only support a population of a thousand at the most. When the population outgrows local resources, the young have to go away to new settlements on other islands. Isolation means the Tikapir are susceptible to infection and disease. But there is harmony and order on the island. There is an appreciation of the natural world and over hundreds of years they have achieved a sustainable environment. When we look at the creation myths in the book of Genesis, they're telling us that our created world is made in the image of God. The created world shows us what God is like. There are other creation passages in the Old Testament. My favourite is the sublime poetry of Proverbs chapter 8. Does not wisdom call and does not understanding raise her voice? The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago I was set up at the first from the beginning of the earth. Then I was beside him like a master worker, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabit inhabited world and delighting in the human race. We need to constantly remind ourselves that we are not over and above the natural world. We're part of it. We have a common ancestry with the animal kingdom. 98% of our genes we share with the orangutan and over 60% with those of a banana. The first human, Adam, is so called because he is Adama of the earth. On Ash Wednesday we are dramatically reminded of our link with Adam when we are ashed with the words, you are dust and unto dust you shall return. The Franciscans have a very earthbound understanding of creation and I want to note in passing the ideas of some of the Franciscan theologians who followed Francis. Brother Nicholas Worsom, SSF, talks of Bonaventure. Bonaventure, he says, explores how the Father emanates the Son, who through the creation leads us back to the Father, and how the Word of God, the second person of the Trinity, expresses God and shows us what God is like and enables us to mirror his image. For Franciscans, Christ is our partner in the dance of creation, who leads us back to the tree of life in the garden of paradise. He further writes, in the Franciscan tradition, the incarnation of Jesus is not a rescue mission designed to correct a defaced image but the final masterpiece of the original plan. And this idea is further developed by John Duns Scotus, the 14th century Scottish Franciscan. Elia Dilio writes, Scotus places the incarnation within the context of creation and not within the context of human sin. Christ, therefore, is the masterpiece of love. Brother Nicholas writes, Scotus teaches that God didn't have to create the universe, but wanted to, in order to invite all things to share in the loving, pre-existing relationship within the Holy Trinity. In creation, there is no necessity, only grace conferring the responsibility onto humanity of echoing that grace with our free response of love. The creation stories of Genesis are not without their challenges. In chapter 1, when God blesses Adam and Eve, he says, Fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. 
the Hebrew word for dominion is very strong, implying treading or trampling. But the word dominion is soon qualified in chapter 2 of Genesis. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the word till has its roots in the Hebrew word to serve. Donald MacLeod has said, the precise responsibility of man to his environment is defined very precisely in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Man has to keep it. This is not simply an insistence on conservation. It designates man as guardian and protector of the ground. Man is the servant of the ground. Christian theology has largely failed to recognize this emphasis. Any insistence on the more widely perceived notion of man's dominion must be balanced by the less familiar but equally important concept of man as servant. So what went wrong? In Genesis chapter 2 we read, the Lord God put the man in the garden to till it and keep it. But by chapter 3 we read, Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil shall you eat of it all the days of your life. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. So why were we metaphorically thrown out of the Garden of Eden? Because I think the whole point of the early chapters of Genesis is their universal and timeless nature. Every day, as a result of our actions, we're still being thrown out of the Garden of Eden. And the fall is almost written into the text, going back to the words subdue and dominion. Brother Nicholas refers to this passage as the smoking gun. On a more cosmic scale, in the garden there is no mention of earthquakes, volcanoes, cyclones, cancers, parasites, viruses. Where do they fit into the narrative? Well, perhaps fortunately, I don't think we'll have time to go down that road. We start with the gift of free will, and that's what sets us apart from the rest of creation. That's part of our being made in the image of God. What in the animal kingdom is the dis instinct for self-preservation and survival of the fittest becomes in us selfishness and greed. But Genesis, of course, sees it rather differently. The main driver is disobedience and human ambition to set ourselves over and above the rest of the created world, to be equal to the creator. Francis of Assisi emphasizes the act of disobedience. And perhaps he does get a bit carried away when he contrasts the disobedience of Adam with the obedience of the rest of the created order. He admonishes his brothers, all creatures under heaven serve, know and obey their creator, each according to its own nature, better than you. In this way, obedience is an act of poverty, a letting go of self, and where there is poverty with joy, there is neither greed nor avarice. Genesis gives us further examples of human arrogance, particularly in the Tower of Babel story. And the Old Testament prophets take up the theme. Jeremiah 4 is a metaphor of a wasteland as a result of Israel's disobedience and the ecological disaster that follows. How contemporary is that? Jesus talks about Gehenna, which was the smouldering rubbish dump outside Jerusalem. 
It is the metaphor Jesus uses for hell. In his, encyclop in his en encyclical Laudate Si, Pope Francis writes, the earth, our home, is beginning to look more and more like an immense pile of filth. The Pope doesn't mince his words. Greenpeace recorded recently that the plastic waste from this country, our plastic waste, was being exported to Turkey and dumped in rivers. And that's only one example among many of the rubbish we export around the world. Next post, next slide. In the 1950s and 60s in the Pacific, over 150 thermonuclear tests were conducted by France, the USA, and the United Kingdom. Over 50 of them in the atmosphere. Currently, Japan is releasing many tons of nuclear contaminated water into the North Pacific. We are only too aware of the destruction of the ecological landscape and how this relates to climate change. Where do we go from here? In his testament, Francis talks about repentance. He says, the Lord gave me, brother Francis, thus to begin doing penance in this way. For when I was in sin, it seemed too bitter for me to see lepers. And the Lord himself led me among them, and I showed mercy to them. And when I left them, what had seemed bitter to me was turned into sweetness of soul and body. And Brother Nicola says, the return to the experience of oneness with God and with the whole of creation was rooted in the experience of reconciliation, of rediscovering the image and likeness of God in others. In the life of Francis, there are powerful symbolic acts. As a young man, Francis embracing a leper marked his conversion, a turning away from wealth and possessions, and a turning to Christ and poverty. In a similar way, we can see the command to rebuild the ruined church of San Damiano as a call to reconnect with the created order. Go rebuild my house. It is all being destroyed. This could be the mantra for the whole ecological movement because the word ecology is derived from oikos, a house. Brother Samuel Doble, SSF, says, understanding the fundamental interrelationship of all things, ourselves included, is the key to the reconciliation of the world. It is in letting go of possessions and control and in accepting the necessary limits of our impact on the world that healing, peace and fullness of life for all are found. And that's very much reflected in St Francis's Canticle of the Creatures. Next slide. Ah, lost it. Sorry. Never mind. I'll read it to you. The Canticle of the Creatures. Most high, all-powerful, good Lord, yours are the praises, the glory, and the honour and all blessing. To you alone, most high, do they belong, and no human is worthy to mention your name. Praise be to you, my Lord, with all your creatures, especially Sir Brother Son, who is the day and through whom you give us light. And he is beautiful and radiant with great splendour and bears a likeness of you, most high one. Praised be you, my Lord, through sister moon and the stars in heaven. You form them clear and precious and beautiful. Praised be you, my Lord, through brother wind and through the air cloudy and serene and every kind of weather through whom you give sustenance to your creatures. Praised be to you, my Lord, through sister water, 
who is very useful and humble and precious and chaste. Praise be to you, my Lord, through Brother Fire, through whom you light the night, and he is beautiful and playful and robust and strong. Praise be to you, my Lord, through our sister Mother Earth, who sustains and governs us, and who produces various fruit with coloured flowers and herbs. Praise be to you, my Lord, through those who give pardon for your love and bear infirmity and tribulation. Blessed are those who endure in peace, for by you, Most High, shall they be crowned. Praise be you, my Lord, through our sister bodily death, from whom no one living can escape. Woe to those who die in mortal sin. Blessed are those whom death will find in your most holy will, and the second death shall do them no harm. Praise and bless my Lord and give him thanks and serve him with great humility. The epistles of Paul talk of interconnectedness within creation. Romans chapter 8 talks of the whole of creation groaning in labour pains until now, and we ourselves groaning inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. From Ezekiel and Isaiah through to the book of Revelation, there is promise of the restoration of Eden. Ezekiel 36, chapter 33, no, verse 33. Thus says the Lord God, On the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, the land that was desolate shall be tilled. And they will say, the land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. In the book of Revelation, the new heaven is not otherworldly. Heaven comes down to earth. Bishop James Jones says, The earth is sacred. It is not personified or deified in the Bible, but by virtue of God's covenant and the cross, it is consecrated and sanctified by God the Creator, and reconciled to God the Redeemer of the universe. And when we begin to appreciate that, we will begin to appreciate our part in the care of God's creation. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you, John. Um, if there are any questions about um, this part, I think now would be a good um, time to ask those questions, I think. Um, if not, I shall continue. Um, I was just going to make a quick comment in okay. um, John very strikingly at the beginning talking about the, the people of Tikapia and, and how well they actually do adapt to this. But I'm just going to post a story in the chat. Um, they were hit by Cyclone Lola in October um, and it was just so been so relentless all these storms that there's actually um, fear now of mass starvation there because though they are very good at preserving food for emergencies like this, their gardens have been wiped out again. And there's a real fear that they are going to be running out of food. So we're just about to send £2,000 to the Anglican Church out there to, to get food and supplies to them. Thanks. Thank you, Katie. Um, oh, that's the link in the chat as well. Yeah, um, so we've just heard uh, the story from um, Melanesia about the cyclone. Um, and I have a few more headlines here from newspapers um, that you just come across at the moment. Um, they're just some examples, but you can find many more. So there's climate change, world's glaciers melting at a faster place, whales, woodlands facing catastrophe, global heating pace risks unstoppable sea level rise as Antarctic ice sheets melt. Uh, world faces a brick jump in pace of ice loss um, around two, uh, 2060 unless emissions reduced to meet Paris Agreement goals, study warns. Um, so wherever you go, whether it's a scientific paper or whether it's, um, you know, the news, um, pretty much every day now you can find 
a headline like this. So how bring, do we bring these headlines together with what we've just heard from John? And where in this world can we actually find hope that we can actually still um, do anything about climate change uh, with all of these headlines that kind of send, uh, send us a, like a feeling of fatalism maybe? Um, that you know nothing can be done anymore. Um, that it's all doomed. Um, so where in this world um, is um, is there hope? Um, there's a lot of despair in the contemporary climate discourse. Um, this is a quote from uh, Greta Thunberg: um, "You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words, and yet I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying." Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? So this is a really good quote um, that just um, shows how especially young people uh, struggle with this um, despair uh, and with this doom and gloom that is, um, uh, yeah, that is in the media everywhere these days. Oh. And um, there's also been an entire um, group of uh, yeah, political theology and uh, theologists that are thinking about climate change in the face of hope um, and creation care. Um, and uh, I'm just going to read you this quote as well. To decide that it's too late. That would now be as irresponsible as living like there's no sh such thing. Opposite modes, but either way, we provide ourselves an alibi, an excuse, an exit from the trouble. To stay with the struggle means to enter not the continuum of dread, but the wake of mourning, the energy of indeterminacy, and the awakening potential of this now. What matters unconditionally may materialize under the most urgent conditions. So basically uh, what is in this quote um, and what stands out especially is that there is inaction in the face of, um, you know, despair. So sometimes um, we might think that the task of tackling climate change is too big for us. It's too late to do anything about it. And this, this feeling that that can, um, invoke in us is as damaging as thinking oh it's all not that bad um it's all um you know the scientists are all wrong climate change doesn't exist um so there's these two really uh, opposite um feelings that people might have out there but the main thing is that they're both causing an action and um that's something uh, that we need to avoid um so the question is where do we still find um this hope to deal um and tackle climate change despite all these um news uh paper articles that we're seeing or the bad news um and what is important to think about is that hope is in the present and not the future so we can do something about climate change right now and the hope is in the action that we're doing right now without thinking too much about the future and not just putting it off as something that we can hope for in the future no we have to do something right now to get this happening in the future um and that we need to decide how we will act right now um, and um, whether we are prepared to learn to live differently. So it's, it's about the things, the actions that we take right now, and regardless of you know, how big this task is to find um, this kind of hope in us right now um, to take action. 